So welcome. Sorry for the little delay start. So I'm Deborah Sullivan, and I'm the chair of the Department of Dietetics and Nutrition at the University of Kansas Medical Center. And it's my pleasure to welcome everyone here tonight. Um, so the university has partnered with the University of Kansas Health System and Johnson County Community College to offer these Cook Right, Eat Right sessions. So tonight you're gonna hear about DASH, um, back to school, so whether you are not going back to school or you don't have kids going back to school, we all are, I feel like, dashing um, you know, constantly, so tonight you're gonna hear about the DASH diet. And it's my pleasure to introduce, first of all, um, Dr. Kim. He is the Director of Integrative Medicine at the University of Kansas Health System, and he is gonna talk to you about food as medicine. Thank you. Thank you. Hippocrates uh, had a very famous quote. Uh, he said, let food be thy medicine, and medicine be thy food. Um, and my background, I started as a family medicine doctor, uh, preventive medicine doctor, then I learned acupuncture, and then I went and spent two years with Dr. Andrew Weil. And he is really big on food as medicine. Um, to give you an idea, he had three greenhouses, um, employed two full-time farmers, and uh, his idea of fridge was he built a room um, that is a small bedroom size, but it was a refrigerator. So, uh, and he had uh, freezers stocked of uh, frozen fish uh, from Alaska. Whenever his friends went to fishing, they would uh, ship him of uh, frozen fish. So, when I when when we went to his house, that's part of the requirement. We had to go to his house and cook with him. And he saw me cutting. He says, uh, John, um, those are weapons in your hands uh, to yourself, dangerous. So he, he said, you have to learn how to cook. So he arranged for me to take uh, cooking lessons for the two years I was uh, studying with him. And uh, thanks to Dr. Weil, I, I'm a better cook and um, better knowledge of uh, food as medicine. So that's him. And if, it, if you look at Dr. Weil, he's used to do a lot. Now he does two things, uh, mainly which is uh, University of Arizona's Nutrition Conference and the Food Kitchen, uh, the True Food Kitchen, which is coming to Kansas City. And it's a um, t like table to, I mean farm to table uh, organic restaurant that is a big hit around the uh, uh, US right now. So I'm eagerly waiting uh, arrival in December. So this is Dr. Weil and University of Arizona's uh, Center for Integrative Medicine. Um, what we call anti-inflammatory diet and food pyramid. And in this system, uh, really recommended is, uh, if you look at it, really vegetables um, and fruits are, we're supposed to eat a lot of that, and then uh, whole uh, grains, and then uh, fish, and then um, dairy, uh, and then uh, spices, uh, and then oil. So, so it's, it's, uh, we have used this very successfully to help patients with inflammatory condition and, um, and gotten amazing responses. And in, in addition, we often use supplements such as uh, fish oil, such as uh, curcumin or turmeric. And um, it's probably the widest used anti-inflammatory diet in the field of integrative medicine. Now, it's not the only way of doing it, but it's probably one of the most, most widely uh, spread. And um, so the basis, again, are vegetable, fruits, whole grain, uh, pasta, beans, legumes, healthy fat, mid-level uh, fish, uh, whole soy food, Asian mushrooms, other protein, top-level um, herbs, spices, supplements, red wine, uh, sweets. And another person, of course, uh, Dr. Hyman is very famous in uh, what we call functional medicine. And, um, and his quote is, obesity caused by inflammation and toxicity in the body. So these are, his ideas are to uh, eliminate uh, inflammatory food, industrial food, caffeine, alcohol, sugar, and whatnot. And these are not DASH diet, but this is just example how integrative medicine is using food as medicine. This is a spectacular example of how food can even reverse um, multiple sclerosis. And this is Dr. Terry Walls, who is in uh, University of Iowa. Um, and she had a very grim diagnosis with uh, MS. And she kind of figured out what 
she needed to do with food. And now, this is example, she is uh, touring all around the world. She is writing, uh, she has written books, and uh, there's a line of patients, I think, months in advance uh, trying to see her and um, improve their uh, autoimmune diseases. So um, the food as medicine benefit is that I think it's very cost effective because we have to eat. We have to eat. And um, it, it, I, I think that's a commonality as, as a biological being. So if you have to eat, uh, then why not eat really good food? Uh, do you know who said that also? Is the founder of Chick-fil-A. I met him. <laughs> I met him. And he said, uh, and, and it's amazing, when you walk in there, the first thing you see is exercise, like the, the wall has uh, exercise rooms. You see uh, people exercising, and then uh, they take you to their basement, but basement has full of light coming in, and it's all healthy food. So they sell Chick-fil-A, but in corporate, uh, they, they have like a eat, eat food as medicine program. Amazing company. <laughs> So the other part is that I think that it gives power back to patients. I think food has a way of, um, it's, it's just an incredible way that brings people together. I think the food brings people together um, and it, it gives power back to the patient because uh, when I uh, talk about uh, choices, uh, people can learn ethnic food like Indian food to uh, take in more curcumin, for example. Um, and the other thing is that once you eat this way, I think that it's very sustainable and, um, and you don't really have side effects except patients uh, usually feel better, they feel more empowered, and <laughs> they usually um, drop weight because they're not eating out as much where uh, sugar, fat, salt is all hidden. So I think that it's all, all uh, very, very positive. And the uh, DASH diet uh, is considered the best diet uh, that the evidence um, uh, in medicine says for cardiovascular disease is considered second best diet uh, for diabetes. Um, the, it's rich in fruits, vegetable, whole grains, low fat, um, dairy food. It does include uh, meat, fish, poultry, nuts, and beans. And it limits uh, uh, sweetened sugar beverages and red meat and added fat. So in a way, this is not all that different from anti-inflammatory diet that Dr. Weil was talking about. But he just doesn't call his DASH diet because DASH diet already exists. And <laughs> integrative medicine patients, I think, already know about DASH diet. So if you tell them DASH diet, they'll be like, oh, we know that already. So we, have, we, we feel like we have to tell our patients um, something a little bit different, but really based on the same fundamentals, uh, vegetables, uh, fruits, uh, whole grains, um, and uh, eating, uh, limiting the sugar uh, drinks and uh, sweetened food. So like I said, this is considered number one diet, uh, overall diet, healthy eating diet, uh, heart healthy diet, rated uh, number two for diabetes. Um, so the next, I would like to yield this presentation to our wonderful uh, Tara, who we have uh, planned this uh, talk together. Good. All right. Well, welcome. So um, the DASH diet, of course, let me make sure I got the clicker there. Um, lots to talk about in the DASH diet. Ten minutes to do it. I'm going to give you the best snapshot I can and encourage you to check out the website as well for just additional information. Um, something to start, I did put a handout in your folders tonight. Um, the chart side is directly pulled from the DASH website, kind of a quick guide. Uh, I'll refer to that here in a bit, but I'll just give you a little more specifics than I'll be able to give you tonight. Um, and then just a, a nice little list for you to look at for some healthy snack ideas, okay? Uh, so to get started, DASH diet was developed in the 90s to prevent hypertension, otherwise known as blood pressure, um, hence the acronym Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. Um, it was designed to be, as spoken by Dr. Kim, more of a lifestyle, something that could be sustained. Not just a quick fix, but something you could do that you could sustain for the long haul. Um, it's an emphasis on those plant foods, whole grains, fruits, vegetables, seeds, nuts, legumes, um, with a, a watchful eye on, on higher fat foods, so sticking with low fat dairy and lean proteins. Mm -hmm. And then watching out for fatty meats and uh, those sugar sweetened uh, snacks and beverages that our American culture has has uh, increased quite a bit over the last few years. 
Um, so in the time that it's been around since the 90s, it's not only been effective for lowering blood or stopping hypertension, lowering blood pressure, but also found to be uh, useful in all kinds of heart disease conditions, lowering cholesterol, prevention of stroke, um, great for the management of diabetes, um, and prevention of diabetes and weight loss. Just a wonderful combination of all food groups uh, with balance. So it is an eating pattern. There are no specific foods to tell you. However, the DASH diet gives you um, awareness of the servings per these types of these food groups so that you can better manage the portions um, in your grains, in your fruits, your vegetables, your sugar. Um, so and then in combination with other lifestyle changes such as physical activity and maintaining a healthy weight, limiting that alcohol intake, uh, management of your stress, you know, smoking and getting plenty of rest together, just an overall good healthy lifestyle. So what is the eating plan? So you're welcome to refer to this to break it down a little further. The servings that are going to be listed on each of these groups are dependent on calories. Note it, um, 1,200 to 2,000 calorie range. So with fruits and vegetables, this is a food group, two food groups that we don't really get enough of in our diet um, and definitely need to increase these guys. Um, aim for three to five servings a day. You may say, well, what's a serving? Hence the handout. Handout's going to give you some serving examples, like a small piece of fruit, um, a cup of fruit, et cetera. So that will help you identify uh, what a serving is. Uh, fruits and vegetables are not only rich in antioxidants, vitamins, and minerals. They're a great source of fiber, which is needed in our diet. Um, they're wonderful sources of potassium. Um, potassium is a wonderful nutrient in lowering blood pressure. I'll say it again, potassium is a wonderful nutrient in lowering blood pressure. So as I want you to enjoy a variety of fruits and vegetables, take note of the ones listed there as higher amounts of potassium. All are going to have potassium, but see if you can't find a few to incorporate in your diet a little more. Um, and again, there is no wrong or right fruit or vegetable. If you like it and you eat it, it's right. Okay, and it's worth it. Um, Fruits and vegetables, all those antioxidants, vitamins and minerals are going to help protect against several diseases, heart attack, stroke, cancer, as you can see them there. So when it comes to grains, aim for four to eight servings a day. People go, eight servings of grains? <gasps> but again, a serving listed on your handout will help you understand what a serving is. Um, it's recommended that we choose our grains, at least half of them, to be whole grains. And the reason being is that whole grains are going to be in its entire, uh, that entire grain. So you'll get more nutrients and, and more fiber out of that choice. Um, it could be rice. It could be wheat. It could be oats, uh, farro. Try something new you've never tried before. That's kind of fun to do, too. Farro has a nice, uh, dense texture that's enjoyable. Nuts, seeds, legumes, and beans. Aim for three to five servings per week. They're wonderful, healthy um, nuts, and nuts are a wonderful, healthy fat. Um, eat a variety, beans, nuts, seeds. Um, people often say, well, what nuts should I eat? I say, well, any nut, which one do you like? Um, they are all are a great source of that healthy fat. Um, to be specific, walnuts will give you a great source of omega-3s, so, um, which are wonderful anti-inflammatory. Uh, so you can add those to cereal put them in your salad, something like that. So, but all of them are good. And then I just can't help but bring up fiber again. All of these food groups we've already mentioned are rich in fiber. Um, and I'm just going to give you a quick little snapshot here. But um, it, it not only is it great for your gut, good gut health, it keeps you full and satisfied so you can help control maybe some of those other food groups that tend to get increased. Um, too quickly, too often. Um, also, it's great for diabetes control, blood sugar control. Um, eat the skins, peels, and seeds to up that intake. We don't get enough fiber in our diet, and I think it's a strategy we need to focus on a little more. Um, so everyone should be getting a minimum of 25 grams of fiber a day. I'm just giving you a quick snapshot. And if you do, I couldn't help but mention, if you do have any kind of concern with GI distress of any kind, you know, Seek a doctor, seek a dietitian to kind of go through your diet and help you out there. All right, lean meats, poultry, and fish, three to six servings or less a day. 
Um, this can shock people when you look at the serving size, <laughs> but uh, that's just a nice adequate amount of protein. It's a great source of protein. I would choose at least 90% lean ground meats to watch your fat intake. Do the white meat portions of chicken and turkey. Eggs are a beautiful source of protein. Um, and then red meat across the board, American Heart Association, American Cancer Society, um, definitely recommend we decrease our red meat. So uh, two servings a week approximate is the, the current um, suggestion. When it comes to fish, we live in the Midwest and people say, oh yeah, I eat fish. It's, what do you eat? Catfish? Fried catfish? <laughs> okay, well maybe that's your treat every now and then, but if we could just try to maybe inc in increase our fish a little bit. Um, the fatty fish especially are rich in omega-3 fatty acids, another anti, you know, that anti-inflammatory property to add. So salmon, mackerel, tuna, um, these are wonderful sources of fish and we should get two to three servings a week. So I encourage you to try different prep methods, you know, play with it, find a taste you like, go over it again, get that palate working and developing to eventually like it. <laughs> I had to do that. I'm from the Midwest. Um, fats and oils, um, in addition to whatever fat would be already be in your food, this is just your kind of fat, added fat, so one to three servings a day there. Again, servings are listed in your chart. Um, and choosing more unsaturated fats, those healthy fats and limiting the saturated fats just because those saturated fats in excess are, are, are proven to um, increase the risk of heart disease. Um, so we want to choose more of those unsaturated fats. So olive oil, canola oil um, versus tropical oils um, or animal, animal like butter or whatever. Just be careful and uh, limit those and choose more of the other ones. Be careful of those tropical oils. I'm talking about palm and coconut just because they are high in saturated fat. A lot of research still being done, but right now we know they're high in saturated fat. Uh, low fat dairy, two to three servings a day. We recommend fat free or 1%. Uh, 2% are part skim, uh, part skim cheese. And this is all on your chart as well. Fat free or low fat yogurt. Um, this is, dairy is the best source of calcium in our diet choices. Um, so definitely encourage you to try to work on that. Uh, look at those serving sizes. I think we overdo this food group as well. So um, check that out. If uh, there is any kind of intolerance, you could always do a soy, soy product or lactate um, to still get in that great source of calcium. Calcium is also great for lowering blood pressure in conjunction with potassium. It's been found in research to work really well together in lowering blood pressure. Um, sugar, sugar, evil word, right? Bad word. Um, sugar can enhance the diet. We're just, we're just eating too much of it, right? It used to be a treat. Um, now it's a staple. It's an everyday thing. Um, it's everywhere. So uh, we just need to learn to find out how we can consume it in moderation. The DASH recommends three to five or less servings per week. Um, the American Heart Association, I like this one, six teaspoons for women, nine teaspoons for men, which is equivalent to 24 carbs or 36 carbs. So something for you to kind of pay attention to as you're looking at food, you know, um, your sweet treats. Now again, added sugar is what I'm talking about here. Don't want to be confused about naturally occurring sugar. Uh, lactose and dairy, fructose and fruit, these are, are good for you. Um, added sugar would be your white, brown sugar, raw sugar, agave, honey, just because it's natural, it's still sugar. So um, you need to be careful of those. Um, and just, just watch how much you have of it and, and fit it in moderately. And then major sources of our added sugar are those sweet treats, regular soft drinks, and sweetened cereals. I'm going to put these little guys on there. All right, so the last component is sodium. Um, decreasing our sodium, it's recommended 1,500 to 2,300 milligrams a day, which the 2,300 is equivalent to a teaspoon of salt. This may take you a little time, but there's, uh, there's not some good examples on that, but the, if you go to the website, they can give you some, some uh, tips there. Um, how many of you understand a food label? Okay, good, good. I know it can be a little overwhelming, so I crossed out the things right now that just aren't necessary. Um, you know, there's all kinds of things we could look at, but for this purpose, I'm going to just kind of make sure everybody understands. 
the information listed there, the calories, you know, sodium, et cetera, only represents that one serving size that's listed there. Can anybody tell me what that is? Perfect. So in regards to sodium, that half a cup would represent the 95 milligrams. Follow me? Yeah. So uh, the, on the right here, I have some tips. I love these. Look at your label. If it's 140 milligrams or less, it's considered a low sodium food item. If it's 300 milligrams or less, it's considered a high sodium food item. The more products you choose that are in that low range, you're doing well. You shouldn't have to be worrying about adding up your numbers so much. You know you're choosing a low sodium product. But you have to be careful. What if I want one cup? Right, we gotta get our get our brains working there and doing some math. Um, so just uh, some good, good takeaway there in regards to sodium. Oh, so blue. Um, some tips there, last slide, I promise. Biggest culprit of high sodium are those fast, convenient foods, anything that comes in a package, quick to eat, in a drive-thru. Not to say that, again, limit is the big word here, but as an everyday eating pattern, you don't want those types of foods in your diet and keep your sodium at a, at a moderate place. If you follow these tips, you get that potassium and calcium in your diet, you can work with that blood sugar, or blood pressure, excuse me. And then, of course, final, just a little picture. It's on your sheet as well. Just how we should put these food groups together um, from a point of view that we understand, uh, just to make sure those food groups are in the right uh, portions that we need to be the healthiest we can be. All right. Thank you, guys. All right, so now it's um, with great pleasure that I get to introduce uh, our chef for this evening. And so our chef tonight is Chef Eddie Adele. And chef, has been, chef Adele has been at Johnson County Community College now for 10 years, has a total of 35 years in the industry working in hotels and restaurants. And I think of note, he is the, the coach of the student culinary team here. So welcome, Hello. Chef. Hello, how's everybody? All right. Um, so the first two uh, speakers talked really well about, uh, you know, how to eat healthy and the things that we look at and and in research for this and in research just for myself. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, I noticed, you know, clearly all the stuff they said, eat fiber, eat. Um, but the one thing I would mention on top uh, of what they said is uh, high fructose corn syrup and how bad it is. So... Um, it has the ability to like block your mind and take away the feeling of being full, to take away um, your sense of overeating. And so, and it's very hard to remove that from your diet because about any processed or prepackaged food that you buy probably has it in it. So the salad dressing that you buy and all those things. So to try and take that out and, and try to you know, get away from it is hard. But, um, and it, it's also addictive, it's highly addictive. So um, it makes you crave it. So you start to crave these things. Um, so it's, uh, I think it's a good process to try and figure out a way to, to wean yourself off of it. Um, and one of the ways to do that is to start to create your own foods at home. And it takes a little bit of planning. Um, if people haven't cooked for themselves or cooked for their family a lot, um, <coughs> you know, to have those uh, busy nights when, uh, uh, you know, uh, you've got to go run and do a bunch of stuff after work with your kids or projects or whatever you might have in your life. And so it's easy to, to grab stuff and and then all of a sudden you're introducing um, these, this high fructose corn syrup into your diet. So I made a few examples today of different things that I've done to try and increase, as the, the, the previous speakers mentioned, to increase fiber into your diet um, with low fat proteins. And so uh, today I made uh, the first recipe, and I, there's recipes up that they're gonna hand out or you can pick up as you leave. Um, so I made one. Uh, so I made a uh, edamame or a soybean uh, hummus. So, and you could take this. So I just bought the frozen packages, right? And then uh, thawed them out and I put it into a food processor and blended it with uh, a few ingredients, tahini, labna, cilantro, a little sambal, right? So it's gar uh, you could do fresh chilies and fresh garlic if you don't have sambal, but that's really what it is. 
Um, and you could, you know, be creative in your own way. I try to increase the different types of spices, different types of herbs in there. Um, because I think it, it brings out flavor, freshness, and you don't have to rely on salt, you don't have to rely on sugar, you don't have to rely on these other things. I try to substitute, instead of sugar, I try to get a local honey. So I can put in there, if I find something that needs a little sweetness to it, um, to balance it out, honey is a good choice. The other choices that you might use are a roasted root vegetable. So, for example, beets become very sweet if you roast it in the oven and then blended it. Maybe you don't want it to be purple, so you could get like a yellow beet that's a little bit less... Uh, obtrusive, you know, it doesn't make everything pink or purple, um, you know, from an edible standpoint. But so um, I made this mixture, and then what I did is I just took chicken breast, boneless, skinless chicken breast, grilled it off, uh, cooled it down, diced it up. And then, so this would be something that, you know, you could make. So if you were going to grill out on s Sunday night, you know, for your family, if you bought the extra chicken, you could grill it off, you'd have it in the refrigerator, you could dice it up, you could make this mixture. And then as you came home, you know, you're hungry. Perhaps instead of grabbing a bag of chips or a candy bar or something like this, you could have this already in the refrigerator with, again, increasing your raw fruit and vegetable intake. So instead of going and buying some of these things, if you're buying some uh, cucumbers, buying carrots, buying whatever your favorite vegetables are and having those peeled and cut in your refrigerator, I usually take them and, and wash them, clean them, and I'll put, a, put them in a little bit of a damp towel and put them in a Ziploc bag. And then when I want them, they last about a week. And so I can go in there and pick them out, and they're already ready to go. So with just a few hours of kind of organizational process on a Sunday, I can have little snacks for myself when I get home. So, Or celery. I like celery, too. It's pretty crunchy. It adds a lot of crunch. Not very many calories. Lots of fiber, So, uh, which would go very well with this. Um, the second one is made with olives, uh, artichokes, and um, a, a few sweet peppers that are blended and then with fenugreek so fenugreek is a spice that maybe a lot of people don't use a lot um, but it has a great uh, kind of unique property it's kind of has this nutty earthy flavor it does tend to get bitter so you have to be careful you don't need to use very much but i soaked it in water overnight and then it kind of brings out some of the sliminess of it and you can wash that off and then i blended that in there to try and increase you know, uh, some, some spices and, and herbs that help, um, you know, with your diet, help increase your diet. Uh, so, um, uh, and then, so I, I took that with uh, tahini. Both of the recipes have tahini in them. And I, th I have found that this is kind of starting to be popular to use tahini, sesame seed paste, um, in different things. Um, a recipe that I, I uh, read and uh, I tried it out because I thought it was very interesting. It was they did roasted carrots with tahini. So they took carrots, peeled them, roasted them in the oven with just olive oil and, and a little bit of salt. And then when they came out, they tossed them in a little bit of tahini and put them back into the oven for a minute. And I made those, and they were very, very good. The sweetness of the uh, carrot itself, you know, w matched with kind of that peanutty taste uh, without, you know, doesn't have any sugar in it, but that peanutty taste that sesame seed paste has. So it was really good. And then I put a little bit of toasted sesame seeds on there. It was very tasty. So that's another kind of idea there to bring it in there. But both of these have tahini in there um, to try and increase, again, another uh, seed spice that, that we don't really get into our diet very often. So um, The other thing for snacks, and I think the other two mentioned this, is you know when you're there, there's you know much more accessibility to really wonderful fruits in the grocery store. And, you know, sometimes it's bad to buy a huge bag of them. I prefer to buy just a little bit because, it, you know, if I tend to buy too much, I can't eat it all and you get tired of it. So variety helps you to just buy a couple of peaches and a couple of, you know, right now stone fruits are pretty prevalent. So you can find them. They're pretty ripe. You know, I saw some good apricots. And you know, I may not buy a dozen apricots. I might buy two or three and two or three pears and two or three plums. And then so that when I get home, I, you know, I'm, you know, I'm trying to increase this into my diet. I probably am not used to, you know, just coming home and e eating three whole fruits, so I might just have one one day, one the next day, and then, so. Um, 